by the end of this webinar, hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about S-chip, a little bit more about storage, and ideally you'll have some of the tools uh, in your tool belt to begin selling storage and, and how to approach the S-chip market in particular. So without further ado, I want to give you guys a brief introduction of who we'll be presenting today. My name is Owen Fox. I'm a product manager at Civic Solar. I'll be moderating this event as we listen to Brad Heatner um, from Calcia, policy director at Calcia, who will be talking about the SJ policy, where it's come from, where it is now, and what to expect in the future as this plan matures and, and develops. Uh, after that, we'll have Elena uh, Lucas, co-founder and CEO of Utility API, talk about utility data, the process of getting utility data, and what her and Utility API have found are the difficulties with getting this and how you can use Utility API as a resource to streamline your project design uh, systems. And then Andrew Krulovitz from Jelly, uh, Director of Marketing and Product Development at Jelly, will talk a little bit about the project, the economics behind the project, and display some Jelly analytics to really show you how all the pieces fit together. A little background about Civic Solar, who we are. We were founded in 2010. We are a national distributor of solar electric equipment. We did about 45 megawatts of uh, PV solar equipment sales in 2016 and pride ourselves on being most responsive and the most efficient national solar electric equipment distributor in the distribution space. We also have three offices across the U.S. headquartered in Oakland, California. We have another sales office in Austin, Texas, and one in Boston, Massachusetts. So hopefully you guys will reach out at the end of this and let us help you guys design your projects um, after learning a little bit more about the total package of the SGIP program. So without further ado, I will transfer this over to Brett to talk about the SG program and the policy of it. Great. Thanks, Owen. Uh, and thanks very much to Civic Solar uh, for putting this together and for uh, the great services they provide to the industry. Uh, happy to take part. Uh, and hopefully uh, all of you are part of Calcia. Um, we represent the industry uh, doing business in California, both uh, promoting policies that help everybody, but then also providing information similar to this webinar that we do on a regular basis for me members with the weekly updates, which I think are essential for doing business in California. Uh, and then there are, there are uh, promotions and, uh, and discounts as well as networking opportunities and, and other things. So hopefully everyone here is a member. If you're not, Join now, it's not that expensive, but we really need to get everybody under one tent. Uh, so uh, onward to SGIP. And um, first off, how big a program are we looking at? Um, the, the, this is what has been authorized uh, so far. Um, it's um, uh, the, the total size of the program uh, across the, the four utilities and um, $364 million. Uh, this is just for storage rebate dollars. So this isn't fuel cell or wind rebate dollars, and this isn't the program administration. This is just money that will go out the door for rebates for storage systems. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a pretty good number. There's going to be uh, significant act activity that starts to happen pretty soon, but it's also uh, not as big as, as it should be, so, and we'll get to that. We'll do. Um, the other thing that is uh, needs to be added to this is the – uh, funds from previous projects that um, have have been canceled that previously got reserved and uh, and now have become available to other projects. Uh, I heard last week from the program administrators they 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 estimated that there's roughly 40 million dollars that is available in addition to this new budgeted money for storage rebates. So that will be added. And then also one of the biggest reforms that uh, that we made in the in the most recent changes to SGIP is pulling all this money forward and saying that it will be available from the start rather than just saying each annual allocation gets opened up on one day per year and when it's gone it's gone you have to wait till the next year's budget to become available 
uh, that has been greatly problematic in the past because it's just so hyper competitive uh, that it it just wasn't fair to all customers to be able to um, to, to to compete and get money. So now that whole pot of money will be available from the start and uh, and uh, first come first served uh, and and but it will step down uh, according to these uh, rebate dollars. So similar to the California Solar Initiative. Um, where you you know the, the rebate amount steps down uh, according to a certain megawatt uh, 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 level that that was in each step. Uh, this is for the budget level. The budget is spread across five different steps, and the incentive levels uh, step down uh, uh, as each budget is depleted. And uh, so, and then there are different different sizes. Uh, it, it, there's you get more money if you're not taking the ITC. Basically, if you're doing standalone storage and you're not taking the ITC, uh, then you get a higher rebate. If, if 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 you get the ITC, it's a lower rebate. But the numbers are such that it still is your in, in your best interest to take the ICC ITC, even though it's a, a lower SGIP rebate level. And then residential gets the gets the non-ITC um, and it's a, at the higher level, although you have to be within 10K. So I think this is going to be a bit of a challenge for some customers. If you want to put in a 12 kilowatt residential system, you're actually probably going to get a smaller overall rebate than you would if you kept it to 9.9 kilowatts. So that is a bit of a limiting factor. But residential up to up to 10 does get the higher rebate. Level and it steps down according to this if the program goes uh, smoothly and and not too fast. Um, and then uh, if each step is uh, subscribed more uh, quickly, uh, then uh, the theory is that clearly the the price is higher than it needs to be, and and then the the incentive level steps down. At a more rapid pace, and the way they measure that is within 10 calendar days of an entire step statewide is fully subscribed within 10 10 calendar days. Then uh, the the ITC for the the rebate level for the non-ITC level systems goes down by 10 cents rather than five cents, uh, and then. The uh, original program had the uh, ITC supported also going by down by that, that same rate uh, through a Calcia petition that was just recent that is, has been tentatively approved, I should say. It hasn't received final approval, but we were saying that the ITC supported rebate level was going down too fast if if it was 10 cents on every step, uh, and it's just not the, the numbers just aren't right for the market, and so we recommended. Changing that, so it's pegged to 72% of the non-ITC level. The commission issued a proposed decision last week uh, that approved the the petition, and so it's uh, headed for final approval at the commission on April 6th. And if they do in fact pass that, then this uh, then 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 the 72% rule will be in effect. And so this is sort of my general prediction is that the first two steps are going to go fast. The first two steps are, are going to get subscribed right away. And so you'll have an accelerated step down. Then you get to step three and it may or may not. There's a, if, if step three lasts more than 10 days in at least one of the IOU service territories, then you don't get the 10 cent step down, you get a five cent step down. So I think this is a, a likely scenario to keep in mind of, of how the rebate levels will be going down over time. And so just to look at how much money we're talking about, I look at the residential on the far right. If this is a 10 kilowatt, 20 kilowatt hour system, uh, your step one, you're getting $10,000 for the customer as an SGIP rebate. Uh, if you don't make it into step one, you don't make it into step two, you don't get your application accepted until step three, then you're down to about 6,000. So uh, it's still a good chunk of change, but it's a lot less than 10. And then for a larger, uh, 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 commercial system, you see the higher numbers there, 200 kilowatt, two and a half hour system. So it's just a general ballpark of, of what to expect. Uh, and then the, the uh, commission wants very much to encourage longer duration batteries. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here is addressing the duck chart concerns and wanting people to shift their load from midday to the evening and really for more than two hours. The, the previous SGIP program had a requirement that you had to have at least two hours of storage, but if you had more than that, you didn't get any additional rebate. 
And so the commission has changed the program to fund it according to, to kilowatt hours rather than kilowatts. So it encourages longer duration batteries. But uh, the, the incentive does go, to, go down for the additional hours and under the theory that the you know, incremental cost isn't as, as much as it was for the first two hours. Uh, so you are now getting something beyond two hours, but not the full 100%. And then um, let's look at where the money is going. There's that 364 million or, or up to 400 million dollars total in the program. Half of it was previously allocated. We passed a bill last year to double the budget, and there's been a big question about how that new money gets applied. Is it evenly across the steps or according to a different formula? Uh, Calcia was proposing front-loading it a little bit more than this. We, I think we said 30, 30, 25, 15, if I remember right. Uh, and some parties said, you know, stick it all on step four and five. And the, the commission came down in the middle. And this is where they're, they're putting that new money. So step one is going to have a smaller budget. And then uh, the, the biggest budgets are in steps three and four. Again, this goes before the commission for a final vote on April 6th. So this isn't final yet, but this is where the way it looks now. And then, so uh, how many projects does that really equate to? Uh, this is just simple math using assumptions that the average size of a commercial system is 150 kilowatts and 10 kilowatts for residential and then two hours for residential, two and a half hours for commercial, but just sort of typical sizes and then here you, you do the math there's how much money there is and what the incentive level is and how many projects you get so i, I look at this and i see that clearly there's some opportunity but also this is extremely troubling because it's not a lot of total projects statewide if we're looking to really transform the market and bring down the price we need volume and this isn't quite enough volume and if we want to have a system a, a program that's going to be there that you can count on when you sign up a customer and turn in an application, uh, we don't know how fast this money is going to go. It's going to go faster than you would like, certainly. It's going to be extremely competitive to, to get your project approved. But, uh, you know, there is money there. There are projects that will get funded. So if you're all set to go with your customer contracts, you can get them in and get at least some of them approved. Uh, Calcia's number one uh, uh, priority in Sacramento this year is to increase this pot of money so that these numbers are a whole lot bigger and it really does become a market transformation program. Uh, and then uh, the lottery, that uh, it is more of a first come first serve program than it used to be because the, the, the three and a half years of funding is all lumped together, uh, but uh, that you've got the different steps. And, and in order to make it not um, first come first serve like, every minute of the day and a, and a really competitive day, uh, they're spreading it across the, the full day in a lottery each time that the step is depleted. So if, for example, step one opens on May 1st, which is our expectation, then, uh, and it's reserved an entire day, uh, it, it, the whole thing is, is reserved in one day, then it's not going to matter whether you turned in your application at 8.02 a.m. or 4.58 p.m. Uh, those those uh, systems on that last day or the, or the one day will get treated equally in a lottery. Uh, unlike the last, last year's program opening when uh, everything was reserved in four and a half minutes. And you know, if you didn't have a fast computer or you had, you had some internet problem, you're out of luck. So that won't be the case anymore. Um, uh, it'll just go first come first serve until the end of the, of the budget step and then there will be a lottery for that final day. And then preference will be given to paired systems, meaning solar is paired with storage uh, and systems in the LA basin because you've got the constraint there from Aliso Canyon and so we want more storage in LA. Uh, and, and so the first two steps again, if those go uh, quickly in less than 10 days, or rather, if they go in a single day, then the whole thing gets into a lottery. And if you have a standalone storage system that's not in the LA Basin, you're not going to get funded. So it could be that the first two steps entirely go to either LA or paired systems. 
Uh, and then a few other rules to uh, have in mind. There is a, they, they stepped up the application fee in order to weed out some of the more speculative projects. So you have to put down some real money and you lose that if you walk away from it. Uh, if you don't get the reservation, you put in a reservation request and you don't get picked, then you get your money back. But if they give you a reservation confirmation uh, and then you decide for some reason not to build the project, you lose that 5% uh, uh, application fee. Uh, it does still require energy audits, uh, although there, you know, it doesn't require you to actually do the uh, en energy upgrades. In the previous program, anything with less than a two-year payback on energy efficiency that was identified in the audit had to be done in order to get the storage money. That's no longer the case, but you do still have to do an audit and you have to do it at the front end of the application process. It can be a quickie online audit. Uh, I mean, I don't know the full rules as to what they'll accept and what they won't, but my sense is you can do a pretty simple online audit of the customer and turn that in. Um, there is a cap for developers so that one developer doesn't get too much uh, of, the, of the entire pot of money, uh, and that's calculated statewide in each step. Um, uh, there's no minimum customer contribution as there was previously. Uh, and then the discharge, the, the operational uh, performance standards are a very important thing to keep in mind. Uh, this is ensuring that you're not using the system just for backup. And SGIP has a rule really that, that it, you're not supposed to be designed only as backup power. You, you, you're, you're putting in these systems to do load shifting. And, uh, and so they're, they're requiring that you have uh, a certain amount of cycling that happens each year and you will have to spell out in a preliminary monitoring plan right at the beginning how you, how you intend to use the battery and there will be monitoring of that. Uh, so th th those are real operational requirements that you have to pay close attention to. And for large systems, your money's gonna depend on it. You, you, over 30 kilowatts, you get only half the money up front, and the other half you get paid over five years of performance-based incentive. Uh, and I think the main thing that they're looking for is that, uh, that is this d discharge requirement is met. And if not, uh, you might not get the money. And that's, that's it for the overview of the program. I mean, one thing to, uh, to be very aware of is that the, the portal will open on April 10th, and you'll go in there, register yourself as a vendor, uh, and you can upload the applications right there. And then on May 1st, the, the, uh, the portal actually goes live, and you can hit go, submit the applications, uh, and then hopefully get your reservations. That's the overview. I can answer questions about this at, at the end after the other presentations. So, Alina, you know, we're heading to you. Great. Thanks, Brad. Hi, everyone. My name is Alina Lucas, and I am co-founder and CEO of Utility API. And uh, thanks for the whole team here for, for coordinating this. Thank you, Owen and, and Civic, for uh, hosting this. Um, this is quite a exciting topic for the industry and so really excited to share how how we fit into this and how we can help help you through that process of getting started in storage and exploring these s chip incentives so in order to get started evaluating a And what that data means is that it's the, the bill amounts, it's the kilowatt hours, it's demand charges, it's the intervals in order to evaluate a site. And what we do is we automate the collection of that data. Alternatively, how people have done this in the past is that for commercial, there's a paper authorization form they send to the utility and you get the data back within a couple of weeks. Or with a residential um, project they're requesting the data from the individual maybe the individual has a paper bill and they take a picture of it and send it or you see it in person but then you have to type um, information in and what we're doing is we're automating that entire data collection that entire interaction with the customer and with the utility and what we do is we standardize that data so you're able to get that um, it's just easily digestible by whatever analysis tools you're using and our system takes minutes instead of taking days or weeks. 
like it is with uh, dealing with utilities directly. So how it works is that uh, you request the data from the homeowner or business owner, so whatever site that you're evaluating for a behind the meter project, you send our authorization form to that potential customer. That potential customer authorizes you and Utility API to have access to the data on their behalf. We collect the data and then provide it back to you, the storage or solar company, in a standardized way. And I'll walk you through what this looks like. Next slide. So when you sign up for Utility API, option three ways to do the same thing, which is send out your first data request. So you click on that. Next slide. Wait. And then you're able to fill in the information of your customer, and you can click on send data request. And this prompts a email pop-up where you can send an email through our system, or you can just copy the link and send it over to uh, the customer um, however you want, like in a personal email. So that's an option as well. So in any case, you're sending an authorization form to the utility account holder. Next slide. This is the authorization form. So they're able to collect, um, so the email and utility you can, can already be pre-filled based on what you filled in. And then the utility account holder um, puts in their information from the utility and puts in their digital signature. And uh, the last bullet point down there says, this is who I'm sharing the data with. We'll go ahead and collect that data now and share it with that entity. And then utility API is allowed to go do this on their behalf. So they click authorize. Next slide. And then the data shows up in your dashboard. So here we have a couple of um, accounts that are, are demos for um, residential customers. You select uh, the, the button that says get data and you download the data. And in, in the case of a commercial property, there can be sometimes even dozens of meters and you don't want to collect all of that data and you don't have to. So requesting data is free, always free, unlimited number of data requests. Once you get the authorization, it shows up in your dashboard and you choose which ones you want to collect the data for. If there's a couple of meters that are for lighting, you don't want to include that in your, your storage um, proposal, so don't activate those. You can archive those and um, just have those on the back burner and focus on the, the meters that you want data for for doing this project. And uh, once you collect the data, you have the PD F bills, you have the interval data, and all the line items um, in the, the bill as well. We provide it in a variety of formats. Um, we, it's easily uploadable into Jelly, um, and also we have integration with Energy Toolbase. And so the data can go into there and you're able to do the analysis. The data is identical between the different utilities then, so you don't have to do any data cleaning like you would otherwise when you get that form uh, or that data back from the utility. And what's great as well is that you're able to archive, you're able to see which meters, which data requests you have out and that are pending. You can archive the, um, the different meters and uh, you're able to share these with other members of your team as well. Let's go ahead, next slide. So as I mentioned, unlimited data requests. Um, you're able to send out these data requests as much as possible, use them in your drip campaigns when engaging with potential customers. And either we collect the data that you need or it's free. If we don't, if we're not able to get the data from the utility, you don't have to pay for it. Um, the, the caveats here are that sometimes the utility does take a long time to even load. They, um, the utilities present the data in a lot of different ways and sometimes you know, the utilities website even, is even down for an entire weekend, and we still don't even charge you for that. So um, it's, it's best to just get started sending this out, get the data you need so you can do the analysis for a specific site. And this is a sales tool, and you can import the data quickly into whatever uh, analysis tool you're using. And especially for storage, it's so important that we include demand charges. And Go ahead and sign up and then mention this, um, 
this webinar, these emails, and we'll give you a free meter to give us a try, check out the data, see what data we actually pull. And a comparison between what we do and Green Button is that if you worked with Green Button, um, you'd have to build that integration with each utility, and it's a at least two month long process in some cases. Uh, only the California IOUs have Green Button implementations. They provide interval data after I think it's a 24 hours. They provide the data. It depends on each implementation because each utility has implemented it very differently. Um, and so instead of having to go and integrate, like you as a storage company having to integrate with each of the Green Button implementations at the IOUs, we do that for you so you don't have to do that and spend precious developer time on that. So we're your uh, intermediary between utilities and getting this data that you need to sell these projects. And quick note on intervals is that um, the California IOUs do have intervals. We're also active in many other utilities across the United States and that includes um, the main for them we just pull all of the billing information and all the line items from the bill we pull everything that's possible from the utility and this entire process we've made it as safe and secure as possible we have encryption end to end and um, the data guard is a voluntary standard around data privacy and security for smart meter data and we're one of the first signatories onto that I'm on the green the board of the green button alliance and you know our system we um, we've built out our service with support from the Department of Energy as well um, and excited to see this uh, being used by the storage community and so we collect it for we collect data for residential and commercial go ahead and collect the data give it a try sign up and go ahead in the next slide and this transitions perfectly to Andrew and Jelly um, so uh, he'll be able to show you where uh, to upload that data this um, screen is a little further on in his presentation as well, but this data is crucial in order to validate the, a site and evaluate um, the right sizing of a system. So with uh, no further ado, we'll, uh, we'll go over to Andrew and hear about how to do all of this analysis for storage projects. Thanks, Elena. Uh, and thanks to Civic Solar for hosting us, and thanks to Brad for participating as well. My name is Andrew Krolowitz, and I'm Director of Marketing and Corporate Strategy here at Jelly. Uh, some of you in the webinar may have heard of Jelly. I imagine that some or many of you have not. So what is Jelly? Jelly is a software company uh, whose products maximize the value of energy storage. And whether it's a standalone energy storage system or energy storage plus solar or energy storage plus EV, our software makes it possible to interconnect any type of energy hardware, whether it's a lithium ion battery or a flow battery, any type of power converter, any type of solar inverter, and we can optimize the operation of that system around different types of energy applications, whether it be demand charge management for a California uh, customer or solar curtailment and self-consumption for a Hawaii customer, we normalize the equipment and we provide the intelligence that's needed to, to deliver a, a project that provides real economic returns. Next slide, please. Great. So this is a chart here from everybody's favorite news, clean tech news website, Green Tech Media. And these numbers were actually just updated. Energy storage had a huge year. So as you can see here, their forecast is that we're going to do three and a half gigawatts in the U.S. by 2020. They just actually upped this to more than four gigawatts. And that red line is showing where we see system costs going. So right now in 2017, uh, system costs are hovering right about $550 a kilowatt hour for just the equipment. Actual install price is significantly more than that. Soft costs add up to that. But what we're really showing here is there's huge promise in this industry. We just really need to build some scale around the products and the processes to make it easy to deploy these solutions. Next slide, please. And that's where Jelly comes in. So there's a lot of potential, but there's also a lot of stumbling blocks in getting projects in the ground. So we offer our products here at Jelly to help solar installers and solar project developers move through the entire process from ideation to installation and management. So on the front end, we offer design software, which I'll talk about at length uh, after this, 
that helps developers with site analysis and hardware selection, provides performance projections, and then produces a performa that you can take to financiers and say, this is what we're looking at in terms of financial returns, and that makes that process a whole lot easier. For implementation, this is really the core of what we offer. Uh, like I said before, any battery, any power converter, we can layer on a number of applications and we automate it all. So set it and forget it, the system's going to run uh, and deliver the performance that you saw in the design phase. And then finally, once you have the system up and running, uh, we make sure that everything's going according to plan. If there is a technical issue, we will send out an alert. Uh, as more opportunities to to receive grid service revenue uh, come into play, we can add those. And then for folks that have multiple systems, you can manage those and aggregate them in a way that you can bid into grid service programs. So it's an end-to-end -end software platform that really is meant to support independent PV project developers uh, as they start to move into energy storage. Next slide, please. Great, so I just talked through the products. Like I said, we've got our design software. We have our universal site controller, which automates equipment, and we've got our management platform. Next slide, please. Okay, before we jump in, um, some of you I see in the questions are wondering, okay, well, what is the value of storage? How does it change when you pair it with solar? Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss now. So next slide, please. Great. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these concepts, but just to make sure that we cover all of our bases, I will rehash them. So if you are looking at a commercial and industrial customer's bill, which is where a majority of the SGIP funds are slated to go, they are built on two key components. One is energy, which is measured in kilowatt hours. And if you look at the graph, energy is represented by the blue space under the curve. Uh, They're also built, however, on their peak power demand, which is measured in kilowatts. Uh, so demand and associated demand charges, which are the, uh, the, the, the bill that a customer will get at the end of the month, are measured in 15-minute periods. And this is the data that Elena was talking about, and this is the data that's critical to have to understand what benefit an energy storage system can provide to a customer here in California. Now, while energy storage systems can do a lot more than just demand charge management, um, that is the, that is the uh, primary business case here. And so what you see now is how by pairing solar and storage, you can actually improve and slightly de-risk the additional or the battery investment over just an energy storage only system. So what you have in front of you, repeated three times, is a real facilities load profile uh, on a given day of the year. So all of these graphs show from uh, 4 a.m. till about 8 p.m. what this facility's consumption profile looks like. So on the left, without solar, without storage, you can see the facility peaks around 850 kilowatts just before lunch. If you add a solar system to this site, and I believe that this is a 500 kW solar system, we'll talk about it when we go forward, but this is a 500 kW solar system, and it's in, it's in San Diego or Arizona, we'll get to that, but the point is, is it provides a real demand reduction. Uh, from 850 kilowatts on this day, uh, at the trough all the way to 500, but it effectively dropouts, you're going to have cloud cover, you're absolutely right, build over a 15-minute period. So if your inverter does drop out for 30 seconds or a minute, or the cloud passes over, but don't forget, in for five minutes, it's not totally going to submarine the demand benefit.
Next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. Perfect. Oh, um, well, there was supposed to be a financial uh, return slide in there. I must not have sent it. Probably my fault. Uh, point is, is that with solar only, you cannot monetize demand benefits. Uh, you can only monetize. to run a system analysis. One is the utility bill to at least under inputs understand what rate the customer is on. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. The second is interval data. Um, interval data is absolutely required uh, for doing site analysis. And the third and fourth we'll cover in due time. So the utility bill, everybody knows what a utility bill looks like, correct? Great. So again, when you look at the bill, Energy is measured in kilowatt hours. Demand is measured in kilowatts. Charges are present. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, it appears that some of our communication uh, between us and the, uh, there we go, perfect, interval data. Uh, Elena already talked about this at length. What is it? It's a collection of those 15 minute billing periods that uh, the customer is subject to that will report their peak demand during that period. It's a lot of data. When you download this, it's going to be more than 35,000 data points, assuming they're 15 minute periods. You can get it from a number of places, but Utility API is by far the easiest place to get it, particularly here in California. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Well, what if your customer doesn't have a smart meter? Uh, they're pretty well, they've got good coverage in California, but there are places like Hawaii there's not. If your customer doesn't have a smart meter, you'll need to go install your own meter, and, um, and that's how you'll collect the interval data. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, what also is needed to do analysis of a solar plus storage system is your solar production data. Jelly software does not have a solar simulator, so you'll need to bring solar data from your preferred uh, uh, system sizing tool, whether that's PV watts, PV sister, helioscope. Uh, you will you will get hourly or 15 minute data or any timestamp that you want. We need that data to understand how the solar will change the load profile of the host customer and what size energy storage system will be most cost effective. Because a storage only system without solar is likely going to be a different size than what we recommend of a storage system with solar. Next slide, please. Great. So the tool itself, what is it? Here's a screenshot. Uh, but you can go to our website, jelly.net, and find it and sign up right now. Uh, this is the most critical step in all of that. You do the basic stuff like put in the location of this customer, you pick their utility rate, uh, you name the project some name, uh, but this is most critical. You have to upload the interval data and upload the solar production data. And when you upload these two key pieces of information, you get, next slide please, these three images. And these three images are critical in understanding whether or not the facility is a good candidate for storage. I realize they're a little small here and I apologize as that I just showed in previous slides. 
Now you're saying these don't look like anything like the load, the load curves that you showed us in the previous slides. Uh, they are. They're just 365 of them stacked up on one another. So what these graphs represent is a customer's energy use over a year. So the baseline historical use is what the meter read for one year in 15-minute increments. You can see the dark blue is low load, uh, red is high load. This customer in particular on the left, not a very good candidate for storage. doesn't have very peaky load. I don't see any red and it's mostly yellow. But when you add the solar production, you can see how the customer's load profile will be affected by that solar array. And now you can see that we've changed the load profile and it's much peakier now relative to everything else. And now it should be a good candidate for a solar plus storage system. Next slide, please. Once you've uploaded this data, you need to go through a few simple steps to actually determine whether or not it's a good project. Um, this is no different than any other solar analysis or proposal tool. What's your project term? What are the effective tax rates? How are you modeling depreciation? What's your discount rate? And are there any other utility assumptions that we should know about? Next slide, please. And what is more important than that is what are your capital costs for solar and energy storage? I would imagine that everybody on here knows exactly how much they can install a commercial industrial system for once they've seen the roof. What they may not know is how much it costs to install an energy storage system. So like I said before, we're seeing, uh, we are seeing equipment prices around $500 to $600 per kilowatt hour, maybe a little more if you add some other balance of system components to it. But $1,000 a kilowatt hour is a relatively middle of the road guess for what most people are capable of installing an energy storage system for today. In our experience, the first one is not easy and will cost a lot of money, uh, but once you've done a few, they become much, much easier. Um, next slide, please. Okay, great. So you've done, you've uploaded your data, you've put in your financial parameters, what do you get? You get an output that says, okay, here are a number of systems that will work for you. Uh, you're probably saying, well, what systems are going to work for me? Jelly has a number of hardware suppliers and vendors already in Jelly eSyst. Uh, so we have a number of folks that you can choose from to do to system designs. Uh, we are also working with Civic to deliver integrated kits. So if you are planning to buy from Civic Solar, uh, you can do your analysis in Jelly, uh, but it would be great to work hand in hand with them uh, to make sure that what we're going to deliver is, uh, is, is going to work well for you. Uh, you can learn more on our website uh, but that is the end of my slides. I'd like to turn it back to the Civic crew uh, and open it up, I guess, for questions. Thank you so much, Andrew. This is Owen again. Um, thank you, Brad and Elena, for your time um, explaining the extra program and everything that you guys are doing with the energy storage space. It's a really exciting space to be in right now. Um, we did have a few questions come in, and I figured I'd pick a few of them um, and ask you guys, you know, what your thoughts are on those. Um, one of the questions here is, are multifamily homes considered commercial or residential for this particular program in terms of the rebate structure? I think Brad um, would be the best person to answer that. Brad? Maybe Brad Pell? Okay. Can't hear him if he's on. All right. Um, from what I understand, um, the multifamily homes are not. Charging the storage. Can you charge your storage from the grid and export all of your PV to the grid? Or do you have to specifically charge your storage from PV and then export that to the grid? 
Uh, um, great, great question, Owen. And there are a number of nuances to that. So let's actually not focus on S-chip to set a baseline there and talk about when you should charge off of solar. So for any solar plus storage project to qualify for the ITC, it must charge a minimum of 75% off of on-site solar generation. So <clears throat> if you were to charge the battery only from the grid, even though there was solar on site, then you would not qualify for the ITC. And if you were operated, you might be at risk of losing the ITC incentive. Now, SGIP, to my knowledge, has no charging restrictions uh, for solar plus storage, but if you're taking the ITC, you should anticipate charging on solar only. The Jelly, so Jelly EOS, our software, uh, if, if solar plus storage will try to make a system ITC compliant fully, 100%, and usually they are. Um, but if not, uh, it will always aim to be at least at least a 75% clip. So back to the original question, uh, there would be a financial disincentive to export all of your solar. <laughs> That you need to, have, uh, to get, the, get a leg up in the water. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, one quick question. Does you find Jelly support residential projects with their analytics tool? Uh, our analytics tool does not support residential projects uh, right now. Um, the reason being is that residential projects are quite easy to model. They're all energy based. Uh, and there are a number of tools out there that can do it. You could do it with System Advisor Model, SAM. Uh, you could do it, I think, with Energy Tool Base. Um, it's just a basic kilowatt hours in, kilowatt hours out calculator. You can build one in Excel. We have. Um, but for commercial industrial, you really need an industry specific tool. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to model. Um, another one here, Andrew. What is the typical payback period for an energy storage project? And if one of these installers uses the Jelly platform, how does that change that payback period from your experience? Absolutely. So if, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> so with S so a good project, say SDG&E or SCE or PG&E on a demand rate with $20 per month, kilowatt per month, with SGIP, you can see projects with paybacks of less than three years. Solar plus storage, PV plus ITC, no SGIP, you can see projects with paybacks of less than five or six years. Um, and of course, if you add SGIP, that gets even better. So the economics are are pretty compelling even without SGIP, but SGIP makes them a slam dunk. It halves that payback period. Now, what's the benefit of Jelly software, you might ask? Well, there really aren't many hardware options out there today for independent solar installers to buy with the level of automation capabilities that we have. A majority of folks who are going after and winning SGIP are competitive with California Green Charge Networks, Solar City, Tesla, and they don't sell their equipment to independent installers. So the question is, is you could, do you want to buy from a competitor, which may not be possible, or do you want to buy a specialized system offering? There are other manufacturers who offer energy storage systems for peak shaving, but I'm not sure as to the sophistication of their algorithmic control. Uh, the one true differentiator, though, is that what you size in Jelly eSyst, our analytics platform, what you see is what you'll get, if, such as energy tools. base or system advisor model and therefore 
I'm not sure you need to line up behind those projects when there's no guarantee that what you see is what you'll get. Thanks for taking that loaded question so well. Um, I think we have Brad back on the line. Yeah, hey, you Brad, got you there? Me? Yeah. Yes, awesome. Um, we have a question coming in about registering for the IOUs. Um, is there a master registration platform out there, or do all our installers have to register on the individual IOU platforms? How do they approach that? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that if you have to register separately with each of the IOUs. Um, I think that registration is pretty simple, and really they're only looking for past program infractions. So as long as you haven't been kicked out of the program, you give them your, your basic information and you're good to go. So I'm not sure if you need to do that three times or one time, but I don't think it will be a hurdle. Okay. On the topic of uh, retrofitting systems with storage, can an installer retrofit an existing PV system and get paid out both for the SGIP rebate and the ITC on that storage portion of the retrofit installation? Um, I think Brad might be the best person to answer that portion. Well, I might not be the best person because I'm not a tax <laughs> attorney and I will not uh, give advice that should be taken as tax advice. Uh, I can tell you this much. Um, traditionally, most storage installers have taken the position that retrofitting storage on an existing uh, PV system does not qualify for the ITC. Recently, I know that there are some companies that have been installing uh, storage retrofits and, and uh, claiming the ITC under the theory that you're basically creating a new type of system. You're changing a PV system to something new and therefore it should qualify. Uh, Calcia can't recommend that. I really don't know if that, it, you know, none of this has been tested. It's kind of frustrating that we've never gotten a clarifying letter from the IRS or the controller of the currency to, to really make this clear. Um, and so nobody's been caught doing the wrong thing to my knowledge, but uh, that's about as much as I know right there. Thanks. Um, apologize for the technical issues that you guys may have witnessed while listening to the webinar. Um, there's, all, there's a few more questions that I'd love to get answered, and I will bundle those together and get answers for you and reply to all the attendees. Thank you so much for joining the webinar. We're really excited to support you guys with your solar uh, projects or your solar plus storage projects, I should say in the SGIP program, and we look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.